Today's episode contains a discussion on mental health, which might be triggering or upsetting for some. If you or someone you know has struggled with their mental health, please seek medical help and reach out to a certified care provider. Long before the idea of mental health was cemented as an essential part of one's well-being, those struggling with their mental health were confined to spaces that primarily functioned on a punitive model. The patients were labeled as dangerous to the society and isolated in asylums. That of course has changed over time. Today, we are in conversation with artist and activist James Leadbitter, who goes by the name Vacuum Cleaner and works with young people, health professionals and vulnerable adults to change how mental health is understood, treated and experienced. With the support of the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, we talk about what good mental health feels like, what it tastes, smells and sounds like, and if we could design our own safe space, what does it look like? I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not occupy the center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. I want to talk about yourself and the t-shirt you're wearing. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good beginning. Okay, so um, my name is James. I'm an artist and mental health activist, and I I live in I live in England. And um, today I am wearing my Hannah Madness T-shirt. Hannah Madness is a artist and a mental health activist who lives in Jakarta who I've worked with on a few different occasions, um, particularly looking at mental health care in Indonesia. And she's a very amazing, inspiring uh, artist and activist who's really pushing the boundaries of challenging stigma and discrimination in, in mainly in Java, in Indonesia, but across the whole of Southeast Asia, really. Hmm. So, You've you've done a fair bit of work on mental health, and which is what we're going to talk about today. But I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about um, the mental health care infrastructure that exists around you, and that um, you've also, at some point in your life, if you want to talk about it, experience firsthand. Sure. So, um, in England, well, in the UK. Um, we have the the National Health Service, so it's a um, health service that's paid through taxation. But in terms of the history of mental health care, in, particularly in England, I think, um, it dates back over a thousand years in terms of how people that have struggled with their mental health, but also people with perhaps learning disabilities or other kind of neurological differences have been confined within enclosed spaces. And there's a long history there of of enclosure um, that is quite a violent history, not quite, it's a very violent history. But in the kind of 1800s here, we begin to see the emergence of, you know, old, uh, large asylums that are the kind of foundation of mental health hospitals here. So those were large, grand buildings, often on the edges of cities. Um, and that kind of comes back to this kind of very English notion of confinement, but also that like people would be put to work and that like, you know, labor and activities would be the treatment for your mental health. Um, and then fast forward to the kind of the 1900s with the emergence of the kind of state run healthcare system here. Um, a lot of those spaces were taken over by the, the National Health Service and that journey has gone on a, on a few different ways from the kind of closure of those asylums and mental health care being moved into kind of general hospitals, but never really moving away from a kind of a system of very hierarchical care and care being based on 
kind of punitive models. So whether that mm. is, um, you know, what we now call like the chemical straitjackets or, uh, you know, the use of a lot of very strong medication um, and not really much early intervention in healthcare. So only really dealing with people when they're in crisis and we don't have what we call parity of esteem. So the funding that goes into health, a lot more goes into physical health than into mental health. So in the UK, the kind of what they call the disease burden, mental health is 26% of the disease burden of, of England, but only gets about 4% of the funding. So the kind of level of care that you might get in a state run mental health hospital in England is, is, is really poor my experience backs that up so hospitals aren't clean they are very institutional they're very drab you know they are not therapeutic kind environments and you know i've spent time in hospitals with people that have also been in prisons and and those prisons mm. would joke that like well this is worse than being in prison but you've not done anything wrong so that's the kind of state that we're in now now things have changed a little bit over perhaps the last 13 years because we have the the right wing government here in England and and that you know the health service has been massively defunded so the state of mental defunded. health defunded defunded yeah it's like oh. the funding down even further because of the right wing government so mental health care has got you know significantly worse so it's now in a situation where in the past if you were in crisis you could go into hospital and the hospital wasn't very good now we're in the position where if you're in crisis there is essentially nothing and so we're kind of heading towards an american model really here i mean something i i was going to ask you this but you you mentioned it directly because the definition i mean the the archaic definition of these facilities sounds very close to that of uh an incarceration infrastructure and uh, the season before this, we were actually talking about crime, violence, and justice. And we, we had an episode where we were speaking about prisons per se. Mm -hmm. And also something that was quite profound, as I said, the chemical straitjacket. I mean, again, historically, when you look at it, you find, at least in popular culture, these um, representations of people being put in like a physical straitjacket, being restrained physically. And now you're saying mm -hmm. that's somehow shifted into like a chemical street jacketing where you're saying the drugs have overtaken what the physical force used to do and you're trying to change the chemical balance of a person and change their behavior that that's kind of what it's doing right well i mean i i think to be i think i think there's some caveats to this conversation and i think we need to be really careful because i, I think it's important that mm. Now, I am not against medication. I think there are certain medications that can be really useful. So I think it's really important that like people who take medication shouldn't be hearing what I'm saying and saying that like, all oh, medication is bad. Right. Right. But I think um, definitely a lot of medication are essentially tranquilizers. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of medication for psychosis, for bipolar, for anxiety. We're essentially giving people large doses of of tranquilizers so and particularly within inpatient care you know um you can be given large doses of lorazepam or haloperidol which will essentially knock you out and sedate you for days weeks and sometimes months and so yes we aren't putting people in physical straitjackets but we are sedating to the point where you know you can become a zombie and you're in a zombie state because the, the you know the meds that you're on are so strong so um yeah the kind of the forms of confinement have changed in in a way hmm. now i want to jump into mad love because that's what we're talking about today and um that is of course i don't know would you would you call it well it's a project it's not a piece it's not a performance but it's a project um yeah. and that has been a direct reflection on a translation of your experience and uh, how you thought all this energy and experience could be channeled into something a little more creative and then collectively be worked towards you know I hope so at some level getting into policy making or design of all these facilities so that 
it caters to the therapies or be that wholesome therapeutic place that it needs mm -hmm. to be as opposed to the kind of places that exist right now. Can you talk about Mad Love? Yeah, so um, Mad Love, a designer asylum. So, you know, taking the word mad and love and, and kind of mashing them together. So, and then a designer asylum. So, the, you know, the word asylum in its origins means a safe place, but hmm. those those safe places should be places of luxury because if you're struggling with your mental health you haven't done anything wrong and to go back to your point about confinement and criminality like the perception was in the past that if if you were mad you were dangerous but obviously you know mm -hmm. we're slightly more slightly more enlightened a little bit more enlightened nowadays so um yeah like what you know the the, the question really of the project or the process was really if we're going to experience mental distress and if mental distress isn't a bad thing, what kind of environments could that be experienced in a healthy way? Because I think uh, people struggling with their mental health have always been with us and will always be with us. So how can we support people on that journey in a, in a positive way? And what kind of environments would you want to be in to experience what could be quite a, a painful and distressing thing at times? But could also be enlightening it's, it's a journey like any other so um for me that process began as an inpatient when i was in a, in a hospital in london and i had a friend come and visit me and she'd never been in a mental health hospital before and she was like yo this place is horrible like i'm sorry dude and i was like jokingly said like yeah, yeah i could design something better than this and then mm hung out with her a bit, you know, a month later after I'd come out of the hospital and she was like, you know, you jokingly said that you can make a better mental health hospital than the one you were in. Um, and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And she was like, go on, off you go, do it. Like, why not? So that idea sat, sat with me about like, who, who has the knowledge to make healthy environments to experience mental distress? And I'm not belittling what, you know, the knowledge and experience that architects mm. have, but if you really want to experience and you really want to understand what those care environments, the needs are, talk to the people that use them. And so mm. that, that really began a process of me finding people who had had experiences of inpatient care or were in inpatient care and asking them a series of very simple questions. So questions like, you know, what does good mental health look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Mm. What does it smell like? And what does it feel like to touch? What is our sensory response to mental health care? Um, what activities support mental health? So what design functionality do we need to put into an environment? And, you know, if, if you could design your own asylum, if you could design your own safe space, what would it be like? What would you have in it? And so... <clears throat> that kind of just kind of snowballed as a process really from you know talking to a few people in some art spaces to being invited into hospitals here in england to that spreading across into mainland europe and then you know going to other places in around the world and i think so far we've we've listened to over 600 people wow. what, they, what they say and um everybody says the same things it's really what 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 i'm very curious we have to talk about what what are those things if you would like well, put it in just like bullet points sure i mean in terms of the senses you know there's there's obviously there's a there's a big focus on on nature but like you know what does good mental health smell like it smells like baked bread it smells like my mother's cooking hmm. it smells like red wine it smells like the sea or a forest what does it look like it's the horizon it's a big sky it's it's being on top of a mountain and getting that sense of a vista uh, what does it sound like it's it's the sound of silence it's the sound of bird song or it you know a lot of people talk about music and music having that connection to memory so it's 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 natural environment and then but then you also get the you know the left the left field ideas of like a man i spoke to who was like it smells like petrol <laughs> it's cars with my dad my dad passed recently and that's a like you know that smell is really evocative so you know we experience design through our senses so but 
clinical environments often smell of cleaning products mm. and those cleaning products are not like they don't smell of lavender so you know or or the you know the sense of a bed that you lie in if you're depressed if that bed is like i've never stayed in a five star hotel but if it was like that kind of bed how does that change your relationship with the environment that you're in so and this is all really obvious and then you know in terms of activities we've had really beautiful ideas like you know i spoke to a, a quite a young person he was under 18 and he said what I want in my perfect mental health hospital is a room of Fabergé eggs and a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> or people wanting a room of bubble wrap or, uh, uh, you know, farms and, you know, activities. So, so that you're not in a deadened environment, that you're in a stimulated environment where there are things to do and those things are, you know, connecting the mind body in a positive way. So things that seem really obvious, you know, <laughs> it's not rocket science. It, it seems like a lot of it has to do, I mean, um, all those recollections or things that people associated with like good mental health seems to be directly connected to memory, it seems. I think it's, it's very, it's the way you described it doesn't sound like it's utopian that it could look like this, but it sounds like something they've already experienced or like have an association with. Mm, mm. But I think that's true of a lot of design. Except products. the Fabergé eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, it's, <clears throat> I think ultimately what we're boiling it down to is comfort and safety. Mm. Because if you are in a vulnerable position, like if you're experiencing very intense emotions, um, that might be the first time that you're experiencing them, them if you know, if your anxiety levels are through the roof, if you're having no feelings, if you're hearing mm. voices, all of these things can be quite scary. So to feel safe feels important and safety and, and memory. And there's a, there's a, there's an obvious connection there. Mm. And what happened after you would spoken to like 600 people? And of course there's, there's a design aspect of it as well, where you, you know, you put together something. Yeah, so we've, I mean, we've, you know, obviously, you know, taking all that knowledge and wisdom that, you know, that we've had the huge privilege to, to listen to and, and to document, we've tried to manifest that in different ways. So we, we've manifested that in the art world through making installations that kind of, so working with architects to go, okay, what ways can we demonstrate this work? So we kind of had made kind of conceptual architectural models that we've displayed at the welcome collection we've made kind of bigger installations that have kind of showed design features so that might be about um different levels of height and how that changes your relationship to space or different mm. textures but then we've also been able to work with the health service here to implement it within help within inpatient care so again working with a hospital in edinburgh uh, which was a children's hospital children's mental health hospital to work with the young people there and the adults that they you know parents and carers of those young people and the staff taking them on a similar kind of process and then and the architects being in the room and engaging in that process that then those architects went away and designed that inpatient unit so and then also you know bigger kind of community projects as well so trying to think about what community needs are so we were able to take over uh, an empty shopping unit on a high street and change that into a big mm. space that took all that knowledge and manifested it into different design features there and different activities as well so we're trying to kind of figure out how how we can create models that inspire change really and and kind of uh, map out um, the sharing of that knowledge in a, in a kind of manifested way. Mm. Now, since this is a, this is a podcast and we don't have any visual aid, mm -hmm. could you give us an audio tour of one of the installations? And if if I were to walk through it, what would I see? What would I touch? What would I smell? What would I taste? 
So the 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 kind of conceptual model that we made for the Welcome Collection, which was de designed by Benjamin Klauski and, and James Christian from Projects Office. So that was what they called a kind of landscape for mental health. So it's set in a valley and you enter through a pathway and you follow a pathway into a kind of the the bottom of the valley. And in that valley, the first thing that you enter is a town square. And so that idea of community in a town square in a common area, the commons, and in that area is like bunting and it's kind of kind of got that joyful kind of, I imagine like the south of France, you know, um, square. But the idea is that there's always somebody there. That's the place where you can always find someone. So if you're distressed or you need to talk, you need to check in, that's the environment. And working off that town square are different environments. So there is an art studio there with a kiln in it and, you know, just like just art studio and it's, it's kind of hmm. brightly colored and um, on the opposite side of that is a bakery. So this idea of, you know, often like the kitchen is the heart of the home and it's where, you know, the kitchen can be the place where you have the difficult conversations and food and association and cooking for each other being a really therapeutic thing, but also, you know, the smell of bread, the smell of salt, the smell of like making coffee for somebody in the morning, the smell of fresh fruit being really essential. Mm. Need. And then obviously linking to that bakery is a, a, what we call a market garden here in England. So it's a small holding land where you know, you can put your hands in the earth and you can grow things. Um, and then that would lead down to uh, a kind of seafront area because, it, you know, a lot of people talk mm -hmm. about the, the smell of the sea being really important with kind of, you know, different natural lakes and, and viewing platforms mm. and this, to fish, it has a bird house in it. So you can, you know, migratory birds have been brought into that environment. And then the two valleys kind of serve different functions. So one side of the valley, is the, is the bedrooms and they they are these kind of bright pink hmm. kind of people spoke a lot about in star wars i think it's in the third original star wars there's the ewoks and they have these like treetop tree houses and that came up a lot this idea of like the joy of a child climbing a tree hmm. and like bedrooms in treetops so it's a kind of that idea but each one is modularly designed because a lot of people spoke about the need to have space that they can adapt to their needs so it's like you can position the bed in this room where you want so it could be that the bed is against the window so mm. you can look out it's hidden in the corner because you want a darker environment um so that's a kind of modular approach to the design of those bedrooms and they are kind of trees in a forest so you're walking around a path to get to your bedroom and it's in a kind of forest environment and then the other side of that kind of valley is really thinking about therapeutic conversations and spirituality because spirituality can be really important so mm. there are kind of you know if that's a valley leading up there are kind of enclosed spaces for quiet conversations there was an observatory in there so there's a space to gaze at the stars um there was kind of different kind of wider conversation spaces so you can need to speak as a group but that's really about quietness quiet conversation and again that thing of like zooming out from from where you are and i guess the other thing about that model is it's brightly colored like it's it's bright pink it's um there's a lot of teal in it there's a lot of yellow in it so colors are stimulating they're not deadened and they're bringing i don't know like i'm i'm here in the uk and i'm looking out at like red brick houses mm. everything's kind of uniform but it's it's got contrast and depth in it through bright colors because why not have joyful colors in life it, it sounds like happiness right <laughs> yeah i mean it sounds <laughs> there's something about joy that's really important and i think there's something about um it seems kind of counterintuitive to be in a joyful space when you're when you're maybe struggling but but yeah bringing that joy and that laughter can be really 
it can be so nourishing for the soul so yeah why not like, I'm surprised speak. nobody talked about like puppies. <laughs> there, there, I, I forgot about the the puppies and the kittens. Yeah, I mean the puppies and the kittens, and the oh, there was, there was I went with a group of very young children. They were really obsessed with baby rhinos. Nice. And, uh, they, they wanted a, a a hospital ward full of baby rhinos. I'm like, great, why not? <laughs> But uh, James, I, I do want to talk about uh, something a little more uh, serious that you mentioned a couple of mm. minutes ago. And um, you you talked about how there needs to be a certain involvement of people who've, uh, you know, encountered uh, or, or have experienced something to do with mental health or how have been involved in a mental health care facility. And it's um, it's interesting that we're having this conversation today because I recorded another episode just yesterday with um, with an academician based uh, based out of the U.S. called David Kisson, and he's just written a book about the architecture of disability, and mm. he talks about how architecture limits the discourse on disability to just the question of access. That for mm. architects, it's often just providing elevators and ramps. And so yeah. he's really criticizing about how we need to go beyond that and really mm -hmm. critique the relationship that disabled people have had in through history with the different monuments and the different uh, movements that have happened with city planning, urban design, so on and so forth. And I, in the end, I mean, I'm leading up to that question, but I did ask him, it's like, how do you, how do you change it? Like, what would it look like to change the discourse? And he said, we need to have more people and he's also somebody who's who's an over the knee amputee so it's like we need to have more people like me who are part yeah. of the system who are have a seat at the table when these decisions are being made people who yeah. are part of the faculty uh yeah. people who encourage students with different able bodies to be uh actively be a part yeah. of the classroom and and what you said kind of relates to what david was talking about yesterday and you said you need to have more people involved and people need to bring in their own personal experiences in order to design these places or or build these places which actually cater to them, right? So it's, it's I wouldn't say it's like a participatory design process, but there needs to be some kind of a system in which you, it's not even a feedback loop, that you have more involvement and more more personal involvement in in how these places are designed rather than just architects who don't necessarily have encountered these places and then having like a top-down approach i hmm no i think it's i think it i think it need, we need to go much further than that because actually i'm not dismissing the knowledge that architects have or engineers have or psychiatrists oh, sure, sure 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 yeah 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 i mean of course but they those are not okay. the only people no, but it, I think actually, like what what we're what we've been trying to propose through the Madelow project is actually care environments for mental health should be designed and run by people with lived experience mm. because there's actually um, there's actually a politics of of liberation and you know we have to address the question of power in this situation like who has power over distressed people and you know often we talk about mental health care being done to us it's not a collaborative thing so actually mm. like what it what we're trying to propose through this process is the idea that actually if we if we engage in deep listening if we engage in empathy and kindness and really listen to people with lived experience will find that their knowledge is really powerful and their 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 understanding of how to design environments is 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 incredible and yes mm. they might not be able to make a building stand up and they might not sure. have a nuanced understanding of different materiality and color but actually it's more than than co-authorship it's about actually architects supporting mad people on our journeys rather than us giving our ideas to architects because mm. um 
architecture like art you know i'm an artist so i i, I include myself in this there's a lot of ego in it and, mm. and a lot of white male ego of course but like um it is ultimately you know space is a collaborative process and mental health is really really complex and so the design required for um mental health is infinitely complex and and the idea that you know for disability um design needs to be about more than access you know mm. that's a really expansive idea it's a beautiful idea it's really expansive but if we're everybody's mental health is different everybody's mind is different and the way that everybody experiences mental health yeah. is different so how right. do you design an environment that caters for that vast experience of like you know there are 10 billion synapses in the human brain that's like an infinite possibility of design so like what the other thing that we've really learned on this process is, is that it's not about creating something that is fixed in time it has to be adaptable and changeable to the needs of that specific person and that and and a specific culture wherever you might be in the world mm. no i mean for sure I, there's there's no way i'm minimizing the role of an architect I've, i live and work as an architect and of course you need a certain amount of like technical sound skills to make sure the building stands but just really looking at the um don't like using this word a lot now but agency of people who've had a certain lived experience be an integral part of the project and which is why it's it's very nice to see how you've almost taken this anthropological uh, process of speaking to people sharing with people absorbing knowledge from people and then taking all of that learning all of the lived experiences into something that can be manifested into a physical space so i mean of course the the process but also the idea behind doing rather than just like sending out like a survey form yeah, yeah, yeah. but i think also like you know i'm i've been really privileged to do some quite basic permacultural tra training and in permaculture design processes the first thing that you do is protracted observation mm observe an ecological system so that you understand when, when the sun lands on that bit of soil and how it behaves over a few years and when the water comes in so that when you are planting and designing an ecological system you have a deep natural environment and how it impacts that and i think that has real relevance for all kinds of different practice where actually you know rather than beginning with a blank piece of paper and a pen and, and drawing shapes or whatever you are really observing the thing that you're engaging with and listening and, and engaging in a real deep deep listening process and hopefully you know from that loads of really amazing things can emerge and better design emerges from that i think Mm -hmm. um i was wondering how do you imagine mad love growing from here what's next to have you been in conversation i mean you did mention it's it's taken a life of its own and you've expanded in geography to other countries other cities but does it have the potential of being written into policy not as a guidebook on this is how it should be designed and then a b c d because that kind of defies the whole purpose uh but as yeah. a process at least um i mean i think so i mean for me personally things with the project were really growing and then we you know like i think a lot of people we had we had the covid pandemic and that really created a huge challenge for us because you know we weren't able to to be together in a room mm. and that really impacted us um and and i think we've you know i've kind of taken a change in direction in terms of my work as an artist um in that i've had to focus there's in england there's a really massive crisis going on with young people's mental health particularly after covid because the you know we young people were just not considered in lockdown and, and that impact on them. So I've had to take mm. a slightly different tax in terms of what I'm doing, um, but that knowledge is still existing. So I'm still doing a lot of presentations and design conferences and stuff. But I think um, 
I think one of the challenges really is how that utopian thinking, that willfully optimistic thinking around process gets translated into the mainstream. And I haven't really been able to figure that out because um, when you begin to engage with big institutions like health service providers or with government policy, things become really beige really quickly. And as an artist, I'm really interested in the edge lands, you know, again, in a, in an ecological system, it's, it's, it's where it's the hedges. It's where two systems meet that you find mm -hmm. the most fertile area. So I haven't really been pushing it over the last year and a bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. how it ripples into other things to be honest mm. but but it but it's a conversation you started and there's much to be grateful for that <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 and i think like you know i i yes i'm an artist and an activist but i i'm not a policy person and i think like i i believe in the power of arts to provoke and challenge and you know the the uh, it, it it has done that but i think I think there's bigger questions around structural ableism, you know, mental health is a disability like any other and the questions of how we overcome structural ableism, like any other form of like structural discrimination, there's huge work to do around um, challenging the notion that just because you're struggling with your mental health that you can't make informed decisions or so, mm. um, yeah. I don't have a solution to that. Let me no, know. No, I, I don't think <laughs> there is. I, I don't think there is one. I mean, I, I only ask about policy because in, in my head, the way I think about things, it's just if it's if it's written, if you know you've like put it in writing, it ensures, you know, its application and its replicability in, in some format and just to kind of increase its 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 reach. But um that was yeah that was the only reason why it was yeah i mean it, it, it's it's interesting like i mean i'm not i'm not totally disagreeing with what you're saying but i think for me as an artist i think like of policy, course yeah policy can be where wonderful ideas goes to die and yeah. <laughs> like where you know, how because it, but i actually think it's about because it is about process like you know mad love as it is a project but it's really about it really is it's a, a process, process. yeah and, and process is where wonderful things can happen so i think like in a lot of the work i'm trying to do it's about bringing a lot of people into a process and mm. i don't think that can be manifested totally in policy because that is also about yeah that is about lived experience so mm. And that is a, that is like that's generational work. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine, um, what that might be like, yeah. but it's something. During the pandemic, I I left London, and like a lot of people, I you know we I moved out of a big city, and I now live by the sea, in a in a seaside town here in England, where there's a lot of empty buildings, and I'm beginning to kind of wonder now about this intersection between art, design, activism, mutual yeah. care, and kind of when I walk along the sea, there's this big building and I'm like, hmm, <laughs> for it. but um, I don't necessarily want to get tied down in running a building in a space. I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of person that likes to jump around a lot. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. And for your time useful. and for sharing. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No problem. I hope it was useful and of interest to people. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. You can follow us on Instagram at Arc of Center and reach out to us through our website, arcofcenter.com. That is A R C H O F F C E N T R E. And thanks for listening.